excited to be here online. Hello, if you're catching us live or you're catching this at another time, we love you, we welcome you. It's so great to be with you. And you know, we are in week eight of our 12 week sermon series on 1 Corinthians. So we have been diving into 1 Corinthians week by week, chapter by chapter. And so this week, not only do we get to dive into one chapter, we get to dive into three. So I don't know about you, but I'm about to buckle up because we are in for quite a wild ride because there's a lot of ground that we get to cover. And just a little bit of context about 1 Corinthians. Chapters one through six, they're essentially a rebuke from Paul. So he writes this letter to the Corinthians and he rebukes them as a loving father. And then in chapter seven, which we launched into last week through the rest of the book, he is answering questions that they had actually written into him. So we're gonna be launching into a moment where we get to hear what Paul's answer to their questions that he had written to them. And so we find ourselves in chapters eight through 10, and all three of these chapters address the same overarching theme. We get to unpack here today the fact that he is addressing some of the behaviors and the ideologies that these Corinthians were operating under. He's calling them into a higher standard of living. He's making a case for why all things need to be done with the right spirit and the right motivation so that the church may be edified. And so we have that same opportunity here today, just as the Corinthians did when Paul wrote to them. We have the opportunity to take a temperature check on ourselves to assess the areas of our lives where maybe cultural ideologies, maybe our family of origin, or maybe just really bad theology has crept into our thinking and and, and beliefs and thereby caused us to live in an inward focused life rather than an outward focused life focused on Jesus and his church. See, the way that Paul conveys this to the Corinthians is by using this metaphor that he uses often in his letters. It's found in chapter nine, verses 24 to 27, and that's gonna be our main text here today. We'll bounce around between all chapters, but this is the foundation of what we're gonna be talking about. He says, do you not know that in a race, all runners run to run, all runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do not receive a perish- they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box the air as one beating the air. I discipline my body to keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Let's pray here today. Thank you, Lord, that you have You have called us to run this race and you've called us to run it well, that you've set out such a divine course for each one of us. And God, I thank you for the wisdom that is wrapped up in your word. I thank you for the wisdom that is wrapped up in Paul's answers to the Corinthians that they have gone before us. And so we can glean from their experience. We can glean from what they were wondering so that we too might shake off some of those ideologies so that we might come under your lordship yet again and bring everything under your authority so that we might further your church and edify this body. We give you all the honor and glory here today. Amen. Thank you, beautiful Bree. So Paul is using this metaphor to connect directly with the people of Corinth because they were the hosts of the biennial Isthmian Games. That's like a mouthful, right? But the biennial Isthmian Games, it's called that because Corinth was on an isthmus. So I don't even know if I'm saying isthmus, right? But these games, they were second just to the Olympics. So this would have been something that they could really relate to because this was part of their culture. This was part of what they they did biannually. And so because of this, they well understood this imagery that he is painting by comparing running a race to the Christian life. And so we too can understand this illustration, can we not? The reality is... We are all in a race. I don't like to run, I prefer to walk, but we are all in a race. And whether we know it or not, we're all running in that same race. So let's not disqualify ourselves, but let's learn what we can so that we can run and finish well. You know, this race is not to be confused with the race that culture not only defines for us, but also freely enters us into without our permission for admission oftentimes. No, this race, it's, it's not the rat race of life. That emphasizes 
the monotonous treadmill of exhausting, unremitting, and usually competitive activity or routine, especially a pressured urban working life spent trying to get ahead with little time for leisure or contemplation. Does that not sound like the life that we live oftentimes? We get so caught up in the busyness of work and school and, and everything else that goes along with it and we just feel like we're on this unrelenting treadmill of life rather than going forward with some momentum. See, often too, all too often we find ourselves caught up in this track of running for the prize of temporal gratification. The rat race will always leave us short because we're always looking for accolades. We're always looking for recognition and approval. Or maybe we get caught up in this ideology of keeping up with the Joneses. Perhaps if I had a bigger home. Perhaps if I had more land. Perhaps if I had nicer things or had more money to take more expensive vacations. We're always trying to outdo each other and keep up with one another. We get caught up in this cycle, but we keep going in circles. See, whatever it may be, when we allow ourselves to run the race for temporal gratification, we run a race focused on my prize rather than the prize. The problem with the rat race is that its sole focus is on self. And there can only be one winner. So if there's only one winner, that means that everyone and everything else loses. And that's a really sad reality. You know? Like, there's this game that James and I really love to play. It's a card game called Shanghai Rummy. And there's a motto that we have adopted because of this game that in Shanghai, there is only one winner. It doesn't matter what score you get, if you get second, third, or fourth place, none of those matter. You're a loser, there's only one winner, so your motivation when playing Shanghai is to win, and that's all that we're playing for. You know, and typically I'm pretty easy going when it comes to games. I, I think I show up just for the fun of the game, not necessarily to win, and James, on the other hand, my husband, he has a lot of great strengths, and he's really competitive. And so he does not lose well, and he also doesn't win well. Like, he likes to just... But there was this one time on one of our earliest vacations, um, we were up in a cabin in Arrowhead, and we decided for the first time in our married life that we were going to take the beautiful walk to Park Place together on Monopoly. And so growing up, I was an all-star Monopoly player. If you talk to my mom still to this day, she will still rave about how I won the game every single time. However, I had met my match in my husband, and he plays by some odd rules. He doesn't play by the rules in the rule book, which as a one is really difficult for me. He played by his own rules. He has some sort of banking fee for being the banker. He's always getting more money. He also has these strange things where he can like buy back your property. Like there's all these different rules, but this is the way that he plays. He buys one property from each of the colored blocks so that I could never, ever get a monopoly. And so at some point, I think I had liens on the small amount of properties that I had left. And to be honest, that game didn't end very well. In fact, it didn't end at all because I got up from the table in tears because I was so frustrated with the fact that we weren't playing the, the, the way that we were supposed to play and there was no chance for me to even succeed at getting ahead. So here we are, 2021, still have not attempted to pick back up the Monopoly game together because it really caused some division in our relationship. <laughs> but isn't that just like life? We either view it through the lens of there's one winner, like in Shanghai, or we get so frustrated with our efforts that we quit the race before we even finish. Because nobody likes to lose. Whether we're a self-admitted sore loser or not, we all have something on the inside of us that craves winning. So then the question is, what are we winning when we're admitting into this race? We all have the opportunity to put in the same effort, we all have the opportunity to train with faithful dedication to receive the winning prize that Paul talks about. That means that we all win. There's not just one winner in that. So what do we do? How do we do it? And what is the prize? Well, Paul uses this metaphor in 1 Corinthians 1 to show us that we are all called to pursue Christ and his mission like a well-trained athlete going for gold. It means there's some hard work ahead, y'all. 
There is an individual responsibility that rests upon each of us. But when we take this individual responsibility upon ourselves, we are able to win the collective prize. Our win is not made up of individual temporal outcomes, but rather, when we are in unity with one another, we are able to achieve an eternal, unfading, imperishable crown that he talks about. And Paul is aligning the Corinthians on the mission so that they might run to win. He is correcting their self-serving behaviors in order to ensure that they have their eye on the prize. And that prize is only found when we are unified in pursuing him and his mission. So what is his mission? Well, his mission is the salvation of souls and the edification of the body. Congratulations, you found yourself in the body of Christ today. So we get to build one another up. See, that is our win. Our prize is found in God being glorified in the church. And that happens through the salvation of souls and the edification of the body. So that is our win. That is our prize. And so we know this to be true because Jesus loves and values people. We see this all throughout how he modeled his life here on earth. In every single interaction, his focus was doing on the will of God, the will of his Father, and his focus was on others. He spent 33 years on earth intentionally investing into people. He set captives free. He healed sickness and disease. He teached, he corrected, and he brought salvation. He sacrificed his own body so that we might be saved. And he invested into others so that his church might be established. So these are his priorities. And that is what Paul is communicating to the church in Corinth, that they are a part of something that requires intentionality. And just like an athlete trains tirelessly to win the race, being a part of the body requires a great deal of commitment and keen awareness of who we're representing when we're running the race. And I wonder if we spent half as much time like exercising ourselves spiritually, training up ourselves spiritually for what is eternal and imperishable as we do for the time that we spend for those things that are imperishable. I wonder if we would be preparing ourselves in unity, what could be connected? What could be strengthened when we are interconnected and able to reflect the fullness of God? See, that interconnected strength, that is our collective prize. That he has more for us by displaying himself through us so that he might be glorified in us. Ephesians 3.20 says it like this, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. See, there's a level of glory that, wants, that God wants to show through us. It is here and it is now. It's not a future glory, although there is a future glory, but there is a glory available to us here and now, but that is dependent on our willingness to each take it upon ourselves to be all that God has called us to be, to show his glory through this great church, through this body. In Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he describes it like this in chapter four, verses 15 to 18. Yes, all things work for your enrichment so that more of God's marvelous grace will spread to more and more people, resulting in an even greater increase of praise to God, bringing him even more glory. So no wonder we don't give up. For even though our outer person gradually wears out, our inner being is being renewed every single day. We view our sight slight short-lived troubles in light of eternity. We see our difficulties as the substance that produces for us an eternal weighty glory far beyond all comprehension because we don't focus our attention on what is seen but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary but the unseen realm is eternal. My goodness, that verse, if that doesn't wrap it up, I don't know what does, because as we keep our eyes on the eternal prize, we are strengthened to hold more of his glory. In other words, if God's glory can be conceived as a weight, and we, the church, can be conceived as a fabric, then what are the threads that make up the fabric that hold the weight of glory? How do we train? How do we strengthen our threads so that we might become interconnected, interwoven fabric to 
where we can wear the full weight of glory. So this can be a house, this can be a body where his glory can rest and people would come here and experience his glory and his presence like never before. We get to choose love, we remember, we embrace resistance, and we choose people over preference. So why do we choose love? Well, it's because love never fails. And I think we have a propensity to talk a lot about love in Christian circles. But I wonder if we have fully grasped the depth of what it means to choose love. It's a basic Christian truth. But we stray from it all the time. Because when difficulties come our way, I don't think love is always the first thing that we cling to when we have an attitude check and we need to check our behavior or our mindset. So why do we talk about it a lot? Because love never fails. It's our all-purpose garment. And at the core of love is edification. Simply put, love builds. It is an outward-focused versus inward-focused behavior. What causes us to fail in a race? Oftentimes it's endurance. And like I said, I don't like to run, so I don't know if I know that to be true, but I actually do because if I don't like to run, I'm not training myself to go the distance. I haven't built up an endurance on the inside of me. And so when hard things come, when hardships come, when we're being rubbed the wrong way, when we come to trial, what's gonna help us inter? What's gonna help us go the distance? It's love. And love is the predictor, it's the greatest predictor of endurance. Because without it, we will fatigue. And we will tire out and we will exit the race. There's, there's an expiration on how much further we can go when love is not at our core, when we are not building up and building upon love. And so if God is calling us to run to win, then we need endurance. This life is gonna throw a lot of crazy stuff at us. It probably already has. And so we might feel like maybe we're on the sidelines of the race today. Well, we can get back in it today when we have a, a heart check and choose to build on love, choose to get reconnected to the body of Christ and see that we are all interwoven and we all have a part to play. And as we equally mature together, we are all built, built up in love together. In 1 Corinthians 8, Paul is answering a question to the church. Um, like I said, they, they had written to him. They were asking about what food they should or should not be eating. In verse one it says, now concerning food to idols, offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge, but this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. You see, in Corinth, in the day, it was customary to offer various food offerings to these idols and little g gods. And so the culture had started to seep in <laughs> Like that understanding had started to seep into the church. So while they were not sacrificing, they were still operating from the understanding of the cultural context that they were aware of. And so the fat of an animal was often burned on an altar, but the rest of the meat was probably sold to you. You could buy it in a butcher shop if you needed your meat grocery for the week, or you could probably order it off of a menu at a local restaurant. And so there were some of the people in the church of Corinth that had convictions about eating the meat that had been previously offered to these idols and these little g-gods, and then others that had no convictions about it all. And those that had no convictions argued that, well, other idols, other little g-gods, they don't matter. They mean nothing because there's only one true God. And therefore, if it doesn't matter what meat is eaten, um, it doesn't matter if it's been offered in a sacrificial ceremony because it, it doesn't matter. They're correct. There is only one true God, and it doesn't matter what meat we eat. However, they were asking this of Paul in hopes that he would agree with their pattern of thought to prove a point to everyone else in the Corinth body that they could operate under the guise of, we're right and you're wrong. They were not operating out of a place to seek common ground with one another. So what does Paul do? Well, instead of addressing the food, he addresses their motivation. They were operating out of the motivation to be right. And that's tough for a one on the Enneagram when you're trying to do everything right all the time. I can speak to that personally. There's often times where I have to check myself and say, am I trying to prove a point right now because I want to be on the right side of this? Or am I seeking to lay myself aside so that I might come to a common understanding, a common ground, so we can do something together versus me just having a rite of passage at the end of it? 
they, this knowledge that they talk about, this had caused them to have like this puffed up perception. Like I just imagine this like puffed up dude. Like the Michelin man, is he puffed up? Yeah, he is, right? So they, they didn't care about their brothers and sisters. They were more concerned with being right than loving. In other words, they missed the point completely. They were looking for justification rather than edification. And knowledge is not inherently wrong. But knowledge on its own will cause our focus to be on self-gratification. However, when love is our motivation, we seek to serve others. We seek the best for one another. We look for opportunities to fill in gaps so that everyone can be built up. See, love is the ultimate foundation upon which we build. And we cannot do anything if our motivation lacks Love. And Paul emphasizes this in chapter 13. He says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. How annoying. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So it doesn't matter about your spiritual maturity if you don't have the basis of love to pour through it. And if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned like those sacrifices, but have not love, I gain nothing. You see, the trick is that both knowledge and love, there's some growth attached to them. There's some forward momentum to both of them. So it can be deceiving. You know, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And you can think about it this way. When a balloon is puffed up, there's only so much air that the material can take before either one puff too much and the whole thing is going to slip out and um, the air is going to deflate or it'll reach a breaking point and burst. Conversely, when we build, building requires a good foundation and strong materials. It requires intentionality and a plan. It requires structural integrity so that it might last. Here we have this picture of these two different ways we can grow, where we can get puffed up, about to burst, or we can build upon a solid foundation that will allow us to last a distance. Each of these things produce some form of forward movement, but only one has the power to edify. See, the difference between the two is the difference between a bubble and a building. Some Christians grow and others simply swell. When we are puffed up on knowledge alone, we have the propensity to get a big head too. Because we have so much information in there, but we never move it to application. When knowledge remains in our heads, but does not move to our hearts, it is admirable, but it's not replicable. It can cause us to view everything through the lens of self-interest, but when love is paired with knowledge, it gives us understanding that drives us to seek the best for one another so that we all might be built up. It's like doing all the exercise, but not even entering the competition. It's a lot of hard work and no payoff. So ask yourself today, how am I building? Am I building with the right motivation? Is the motivation in order to strengthen the whole, or am I just consuming a bunch of information to better myself? Ask yourself, am I actually stepping out to use the revelation that I've received? Am I disciplined to spend time with God, spend time with the Holy Spirit, receive all these fresh downloads and revelation, but I choose not to show up to Tuesday morning prayer to be able to pour out from all that I've been filled up and to prophesy, to build up, to edify someone in the body? Am I using that all just to consume me or am I using it to fill me to pour out in love? Or perhaps you have a deep identity of your identity in Christ. You have a deep understanding of that. But there's so many people who have no clue what their identity is, and they're searching for it in this city. And so do you allow your identity to just be who you are? Do you allow that to be the rivers that flow into telling people how they've been created so that they can be built up and come to know their creator? Or perhaps you're in a group, a neighborhood group, and there's someone in your group that looks like they're about to make a wrong relationship decision, or maybe they're going down the wrong track, or you can see, you have foresight to see that there's something 
in their way that they should probably move out, that there should be a correction moment. But instead of embracing the awkward correction, you let it keep passing by. Instead of loving them enough to say something in truth and love, you allow them to just make the mistake anyways because you're too puffed up on knowledge and concerned about your image. Instead of treating each other based on what we know, like the Corinthians did, we interact with affection. We interact with goodwill and benevolence towards one another in order to see everyone grow into full maturity. I think oftentimes when we talk about maturity in Christ, it's such a me-focused thing, like I am maturing. But your individual maturity, that is not the marker of growth. No, when we are woven together in strength, when we are all maturing together, we are able to be knit together and woven together in strength so that we might be strong enough to hold the glory of God. So when love is our motivation, we build up and we are built up. And that is what enables us to endure well. Secondly, we embrace resistance. And I also am not particularly uh, aware of um, boxing because I'm not a huge boxer, if you can't tell. (laughs) But um, we get to unpack what uh, Paul is meaning here because resistance, well, that's engaging in exercise that causes muscles to contract against an external resistance like a weight with the expectation of increases in strength, power, and endurance. So when you work out, you don't just work out and allow yourself to just like have no forward momentum. You actually want some sort of resistance. You want something, you want to keep increasing the weight so that you keep building, you keep building the muscle, you keep growing in strength. And if we're honest, we don't generally embrace the idea of resistance in our lives. Like when we feel like there's a resistance, I think we have a tendency to, like there is There's weight to this. There are some spiritual resistances, but some things are just normal things of life that we give a cop out to when we feel any sort of challenge or resistance that, oh, I don't feel like the Lord is actually calling me to keep going that direction. Oh, what changed from three months ago then? So let's not use resistance to cop out because it takes a lot of hard work and it takes determination. And when you're building a new muscle, that takes time. And also it hurts a little, does it not? You have to move past the pain to see what is produced on the other side, which is a new level of strength and stamina. When we embrace resistance because the end result is developed by discipline and moments of discomfort, it is far greater than an underdeveloped muscle that crumbles under the weight. So are we pulling our own weight? Are we all building our own muscles so that we are strengthened together. Paul outlines it for us in 1 Corinthians 9, 26 and 27. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body to keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So the first thing we must learn about resistance is that we cannot run around aimlessly. To be aimless is to be without purpose or direction. And without purpose or direction, we are left to sprint in short bursts towards whatever shiny object we think is going to bring fulfillment to us. But all that ends up doing is leave us out of breath, tuckered out, and disappointed. See, running aimlessly allows us to dodge, duck, and stumble our way through when hurdles come our way. But we run, when we run without purpose, it's far easier to simply change direction when a challenge arises, then to stay the course, to face it head on. And when we run without direction, it's not necessary for us to check our pace because we actually have no destination in sight in the first place. The aimless running resists discomfort because it's easier to live a life of comfort for ourselves than to, be, to allow ourselves to be sharpened through the challenges that build up the resistance within us. Comfort will always mislead us out of the arena, far away from challenges, and when our, when our purpose is not tied to the prize. And this is why Paul is emphasizing this. He's saying that he does not run aimlessly because when we run with, with purpose and direction, the temporary discomfort arising from challenges that we face, they're worth it because growth is on the other side of it. And not just growth for myself, but for the whole body. You see, Paul was single-minded in his focus. His sole focus was doing whatever it took to advance the gospel, to share what Jesus Christ had done in his life and what he can do in your life. No matter the resistance he faced, and he faced quite 
a bit. He was shipwrecked. He'd been beaten. He had been thrown in jail. I mean, he'd been bitten by a snake. I I mean, there's no shortage of challenges that Paul had to overcome. But he endured through it all because his focus was on the prize. His focus was on the one that is the author and the perfecter of his faith. And so we have each been given a platform as well to be able to run with that same focus, to run the same race. And albeit our challenges probably look a bit different, unless you've been shipwrecked. However, wherever that we find ourselves, we have a platform that we can have the sole focus on advancing the gospel, to be others focused, to be always looking at what we can do for others. He goes on to say, I do not box as one beating the air. Resistance only comes by way of an opposing weight or force. See, when a boxer throws punches in the air, Well, yeah, you're going to build up some muscle and some strength as you're starting out, but it's not long before you're going to need some resistance. You're going to need some sort of weight to, to bounce off of so that you're actually building exponentially. You're building power and you're increasing your muscle. See, shadow boxing has a slower rate of growth than boxing against a bag. And so we need to embrace We need to introduce the bag into our lives. And how do we do that? It's through community. When we invite resistance that comes by way of allowing ourselves to be discipled and also embedding ourselves into the fabric of community, we experience growth in a new way. And without it, our gifts, our muscles, they remain undeveloped. See, when there's no resistance... When you're alone, there's no resistance, right? So when you're not in the context of community, when you're just on your own living that life, there's no resistance. There's no one calling out something in you. There's no one discipling you. There's no one carving the sharp. They're not sharpening you. But when you're in the context of relationship, when you're in the context of community, we're introducing resistance so that, just like a coach does for a boxer, they're able to see where do you need to strengthen your shots? Where do you need to get a better shot? Where where are your weaknesses? Where are you short-sighted? When we allow ourselves to be discipled in the house of God, we're allowing a coach to come into our lives to say, hey, I don't think you should go this direction. Hey, let's talk about that attitude. Hey, I noticed something on Sunday. Should we talk about that? Why are we a little bit snippy? But those things, those things are carving something out of us. And community is, it's hard. The resistance that comes with community is hard because iron sharpening iron is not great. Like it's hot, there's friction, there's sparks flying, and it means that we're rubbing up against each other, but when we're all committed to that together, we're able to embrace the resistance together. We invite correction, we invite challenge, we allow others to call us into new realms, because at the end of the day, we're inviting the resistance so that people might discover the gold in us and call us into new realms, call things out in us that God has put on the inside of us that perhaps we couldn't discover on our own. And finally, embracing resistance must start with our mindset. Paul says, I discipline my body and I keep it under control. So we can think of these three forms of resistance as concentric circles. So not running aimlessly is outward focus. That's the big one. And so we're focused on how we're impacting others. And then the middle one is not simply beating the air. So that's all about community. So we're going out a little further in and then being disciplined in how we spend time with God. That's how we get the overflow, and that's, where it, it, that's at the core of all that we are. If we do not have the spiritual disciplines down, the other two, well, they have no effect. Disciplining our body, disciplining our minds, spiritually putting those practices into place so that we're being built up in the presence of our Father, that is the foundation and that is the core. Do we spend time in prayer Do we spend time glorifying him in worship? Do we spend time allowing the the, the truth of his word to carve things out in us? And yes, it takes time. Understanding doesn't come overnight. But when we are committed to the disciplines of it, when we're committed to doing it day in and day out, we're able to stay the course. 
See, the resistance that we face when we are spiritually disciplining ourselves, well, that's, that comes in the form of waking up early, setting aside time, putting down your phone or turning off Netflix. It's saying no to certain things in order to discipline our thought life, to put on the mind of Christ, or discipline our behaviors so that we might be walking out in the right motivations. And we need to embrace resistance because the end result developed by discipline and moments of discomfort are far greater than that underdeveloped muscle. It's hard work, sometimes it's painful, but when we all embrace resistance together, we build a collective strength that allows us to carry the weight. And lastly, we choose people over preference. See, the Corinthians were focused on just one question. What harm will this do to me? And we see this in chapter 10, verses 23 and 24. Paul writes, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. See, if we do not see people as the prize, then none of this makes sense. Paul is correct in the Corinthians thought process about, well, if it's not harmful for me, what's the harm, right? But just because it's not harmful for me doesn't mean that there's fruit attached to it. And so this fruit isn't just for us, it's for those that we're encountering and those that might not have been able to partake of the fruit. And so Paul is correcting this thought pattern. They were so focused on what they could get away with and whether or not they were right that, that they were just focused on themselves and they lost the plot. So I wanna ask us here today, are our personal preferences getting in, way, in the way of advancing the gospel? Are we living in such a way that would prefer to seek the best for one another? our brothers and sisters over what is nice for us. You know, some of, some of us might be doing this and we don't even realize it. Perhaps we have a friend that struggles with addiction, struggles with alcohol, and it, it's okay for us. We don't struggle with that. And so instead of meeting them where they're at, we continue to bring that around their world instead of bringing them on the journey. It's not harmful for me. Do I... Do I prefer that or do I pre prefer to build up my friend, my brother or sister in Christ who might struggle with that? What about the entertainment or media that we're watching and that we're consuming? There's a lot of rubbish out there and perhaps it's not harmful for someone, but perhaps there is a real addiction or struggle wrapped up in some things that are shown in HBO shows. Do we allow ourselves to still gather around those tables and indulge in those things together because it's not harmful for me? Or do we take the personal preference aside and we seek to find common ground? See, this is characterized by unusual generosity. We are the church and we are called to be characterized by people of unusual generosity, of people that live with open hands and open hearts, that seek to come to understanding with one another, that seek to come to where people are at, to seek to find common ground with one another rather than calling them up and expecting them to come to where we're at. See, when we're united in serving one another over serving the needs of ourselves, we are truly living in a way that edifies the body and advances the gospel. So the question is, are we willing to pay the price? Because it costs us something to be a part of community. But we are people that are marked by unusual generosity. Paul talks about this great cost in his letter to the Romans. He describes it as living as living sacrifices. There is a great cost attached to that. And you know, when we think about it, when things are made cheaply, there's still a price that was paid for it to be made cheaply. And so I wonder, I don't think we treat church like fast fashion, so to speak, but I do wonder if many of us are treating the church as a production factory filled with underpaid laborers so that we can get the best deal. What is the best deal? Well, the best deal is however I want the church to serve me. And there's no unusual generosity attached to that. How can I get more for expending less? 
the best deal gets caught up in how is this benefiting me rather than how am I maturing in Christ and living my life in such a way that is sacrificial and loving and that is concerned with the whole. And I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna skip ahead here. But I do just wanna note that the strength of any fabric is dictated by the weight of the threads and the weaving that it undergoes and the time and the intentionality that the creator or the artist takes to build the fabric. Well, that's, the, that's like the difference between linen pants and then 14 ounce jeans. Linen pants, are, there's, they're a wider weave, they're a lighter fabric, and so if you fall, if you trip, they're probably not gonna shield you from much. But 14 ounce jeans, 14 ounce jeans saved my husband's life when he came off of his motorcycle. There is a weight that is produced when we strengthen the fabric of our lives, when we strengthen the cords, these cords, when we build with love, when we embrace resistance, when we choose people over preference, we are strengthening the cords and the fabric so that the interwoven connectivity of what we are producing as a body, as a collective whole, is able to withstand the beautiful weight of God's glory. And in conclusion, Paul writes, he writes to them in chapter 10, he, he's admonish, or he's encouraging them to finish well, finish the race well. And he uses this example of how the Israelites, when they're leaving um, Egypt, that they got so caught up in what they couldn't have and what they shouldn't have. And so he's saying, it is important for you to finish well. Use them as an example. They weren't able to finish well, but you can finish well. They were caught up in chasing the rat race. But Paul wants the Corinthians and he wants us to know that we are called to pursue Christ and his mission like well-trained athletes, going for the gold. And like I said, this is an individual responsibility. But when we all do this, the prize at the end of it far outweighs the discomfort that we might receive in the temporary moments of, of discomfort. God's glory is found in the church. It's found in us. But when we are on our own, yes, there's a future glory, but when we are connected together, there is a glory that is here and it is now. And so there's an option for us to keep carrying on with uh, the reasonably admirable, admirable Christian life. There sure is. We can keep doing what we're doing. That, that's the option, but there's no longevity attached to that. See, the future glory versus the now glory, that's what we're building together. We get to build that together. And when we lack a conviction of what we're meant to be building, we can opt out of it really easily. So we must carry the conviction of what it means to advance the gospel and to edify the body. Because when the storms come, something's gonna give. So I just wanna encourage us here today. Let's build well. Let's build with love. Let's embrace resistance. Let's get connected to community and know that it's for our benefit, it's for our good. And let's choose people over our preferences. Let's lay our lives down because that is what Jesus modeled for us. These are how we strengthen as a body. And you know what? The crown that he talks about, it says that runners run for a perishable crown, but we get to run for an imperishable. So let's run for the imperishable. Let's run for the eternal weight of glory. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are here, that you are ministering to us, that as we dive into your scripture, as we dive into the truth of your word, as we're learning from the Corinthians. God, I thank you that you're carving something out on the inside of us, that we are leaving different than we came and we are leaving with a deeper understanding of you, Jesus, of your mission and what it means to serve you and to serve others. God, I thank you that you have such a beautiful weight of glory that you want to rest on us. And so we might be people that would do the hard work so that we would see more of your glory and more of your kingdom come in this great city. It's in your name we pray, amen.